Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Becky McIntyre, and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a proud supporter of the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society, and so glad to be here. Welcome to tonight's lecture, an in, uh, interactive talk on infertility. I know firsthand how sometimes sensitive, overwhelming, and emotional this subject can be, and how important resources, information, and community are for an infertility journey. I'm very happy to have you all here for this event and a conversation between us. I'm delighted to share a warm and heartfelt welcome message from the co-chairs of the Women's Society. They will introduce the upcoming lecture and share more about our society's deep passion for supporting women's health care. Welcome to Between Us. We're so happy you're here. My name is Rhiannon Adams and my pronouns are she, her. My name is Vanessa Lancaster and my pronouns are she, her. We're excited to be here as co-chairs of the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society. The Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society welcomes community volunteers from all walks of life to join us as we break down barriers and raise awareness and funds for Alberta's only dedicated women's hospital. A hospital that provides such specialized care as high-risk maternal care, minimally invasive surgeries, and treatment of women's cancers. Since our founding in 2017, the Women's Society has raised close to a million dollars in support of the Lois Hole Hospital for Women. Our hospital proudly cares for women in all ages and stages of life, from a land mass covering a third of Canada, and we are proud to support it. Your presence and support today helps make all of this possible. Thank you. Formerly known as What the Health, we debuted a new brand this year renaming this engaging speaker series Between Us, Exploring the Mind and Body. Most often conversations that start with Just Between Us come from a place of trust. This rebrand represents the essence of trust where intimate and less openly discussed subjects like personal health matters find a safe space for discussion. We aspire for this new name to reflect the depth of honesty, intimacy, and expert insight shared during these talks by the speakers who join us. Following the event, we'll be sending out a survey via email seeking your valuable feedback. Every participant who completes the survey will be entered into a draw for a chance to win a $25 gift card courtesy of Alberta Blue Cross. A heartfelt appreciation goes out to Alberta Blue Cross for their steadfast support as presenting sponsor enabling us to host this informative series. Please join me and Rhiannon in extending a warm welcome to Alberta Blue Cross for the land acknowledgement. Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here tonight. My name is Ashley Bolduke and I'm the manager of community impact at Alberta Blue Cross. Um, I'd like to start off the evening by delivering a land acknowledgement. Today and every day, we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6 territory. We recognize that the city of Edmonton and us, the people here, are beneficiaries of this peace and friendship treaty. Treaty 6 encompasses the traditional territories of numerous Western Canada First Nations, such as the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. We are taking this important moment here today to acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley, and thank you, Blue Cross. I now have the honor of introducing tonight's presenters. First up, Dr. Ariana Daniel. Dr. Daniel is a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist and the medical director, medical director of Alberta Reproductive Center. Dr. Daniel, drawn to a patient-centered vision for infertility care, became involved in the realization of Alberta Reproductive Center, which is a full-service Edmonton-owned and operated fertility clinic. Dr. Daniel has an active interest in research and medical education, she is also an associate prof professor at the University of Alberta. We are lucky enough to have two presenters tonight. And that second presenter is Caroline Anderson. Caroline is a registered psychologist in a private practice in Edmonton, where she specializes in reproductive mental health. 
Caroline is very passionate about her work in reproductive mental health and has extensive experience, <clears throat> um, sorry, has an ex extensive experience working with individuals, couples, and groups undergoing fertility treatments. She is also a past supporter of the Lois Hole Women's Society. Thank you. So welcome to both of our presenters. And with that, I pass the reins over to you. Uh, so um, thank you so much for inviting me today. It's really such an honor to be here with you this evening. Um, I, I really feel like we need more events and opportunities to speak about infertility more openly. I think it's really important for us to bring awareness by talking about it in public forums such as this one, and for myself as a healthcare professional to help normalize the experience. Infertility can be incredibly isolating. No one talks about it. You feel like no one else is going through it. This conversation today really helps to bring communities of people who are wondering if they have infertility, those who are starting their journey with infertility, those who are in the midst of seeking treatment for it, and those who are supporting people facing infertility. This session really is a chance for us to say, you're not alone. Uh, there are other people in the same place as you are. It's okay to talk about infertility and the challenges and your feelings around it, and we can help support you. And I think the more we talk about infertility, I hope the more that it makes it okay for us as a society to go ahead and to do that. The session today is general. It's intended for informational and educational purposes only. This is not medical advice, and it certainly can't replace the conversation with your own uh, personal physician. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about the, some background, um, the referral process or who needs a referral, what maybe to expect at a first appointment, investigation and diagnoses, and then treatment options. So why are we talking about this? Well, the World Health Organization in 2023 this year published a report showing that one out of six people worldwide will experience infertility in their lifetime. Infertility doesn't discriminate, and there's no single factor that's responsible for fertility challenges. This challenge is a global medical issue. I'm not sure how many people are in the audience today, but if we had 100, that's 17 of you. And everyone knows someone who's faced fertility challenges or has supported someone through their journey. For many, there's a stigma with the diagnosis of infertility, meaning that people sit in silence, either preventing them from seeking the medical help that they need, or being able to have open conversations about their challenges. And as I mentioned, I'm hoping this session today will help to open this discussion and normalize this very common medical issue. So traditionally, infertility is defined as 12 months of regular unprotected intercourse without conception, primary infertility, reflecting that a pregnancy has never been achieved, and secondary infertility, um, showing that at least one prior pregnancy has been achieved regardless of the outcome. Very exciting for our profession, very exciting for people. There's a new definition of infertility that the American Society of Reproductive Medicine um, has introduced. And it really reflects the fact that infertility is a disease, it's a condition, it's the inability to achieve a successful pregnancy based on medical issues, sexual and reproductive history, age, physical finding, diagnoses, and the need for medical intervention, which may include things like the use of donor gametes, donor sperm or donor eggs or donor embryos in order to achieve a successful pregnancy, either as an individual or with a partner. It reflects um, the fact that different people need investigations at different times. So if you're over the age of 35, you should be seen at six months. And if you're under the age of 35 at 12 months, and really, I think the most important part of this is how inclusive this definition is. It says that nothing should be used to deny or delay treatment to any individual, regardless of relationship status or sexual orientation. This is from Statistics Canada. We know that Canada is a low fertility country. Fertility rates have been steadily declining since 2008. And this trend has been, has been intensified by the COVID-19 pandemic. The fertility rate as um, defined by child per woman in 2011 was 1.6 and by 2020 had dropped to 1.4. This is well below the replacement level of 2.1 children per woman. And we know that a growing number of people in Canada are delaying childbearing. 
The average age of the delivering parent at childbirth in 2011 was 30.2, and by 2020, 31.3. For people, this means that they may struggle with infertility and may not have the number of children that they had planned, or I should say, in the way that they have planned. Now, why are people waiting? Lack of a partner, educational training, professional pursuits, personal reasons, financial constraints, circumstances. Certainly there are many reasons and all of them are valid. We, however, know that there are consequences of waiting to conceive. Peak fertility, we say, is at the average age of 24 years and then gradually starts to decline at 27, dropping off more rapidly at 35 years of age. And as we get older, we know there's a decrease in quality and quantity of the eggs that we have. This means an increase in miscarriage due to increase in genetic abnormalities. So for example, with increased age, there's an increased risk of things like Down syndrome. And we know that advanced reproductive age is the most important risk factor for early miscarriage. So for people who are between the age of 40 and 44, miscarriage rates may be as high as 51% and over 45, higher than 90%. So who needs a referral? We know that the majority of people in heterosexual couples who are trying for pregnancy conceive within the first six months, about three quarters, 85% in the first year, and then by two years, 93%. There are certain people that need to be evaluated at less than 12 months. If you're someone who's over 35 years of age, who has a regular or no periods, who's had previous abdominal or pelvic surgery or an exam that was abnormal. If there's a known or suspected abnormality of the uterus or the tubes, either through imaging or surgery or physical exam. If you have diagnosed endometriosis, especially stage three and stage four, or if you have a history of chemotherapy or radiation therapy or planning it. And then for sperm providers, a known or suspected poor sperm quality, previous abnormalities of the genital um, system, a history of surgery of the urogenital system, a known varicocele, which is the swelling of the vessels around the testicle, a significant systemic illness, or again, a history or planning chemotherapy or radiation therapy. And certainly, we, we don't only see people with infertility, but those with fertility challenges. And there are people who need immediate evaluation and assistance same-sex couples, transgender patients, single parents by choice, those that are looking for fertility preservation, um, for delaying childbearing, they're planning surgery, they're facing cancer treatments, those with genetic conditions looking for testing of embryos before implantation, people who are struggling with losses, or anyone that you identify as someone who's had a previous serious challenge conceiving or may require fertility um, saving services. Now, if you think you would benefit from a referral to a fertility specialist, it does require referral by a physician, a family doctor, obstetrician gynecologist, a surgeon, an oncologist, a walk-in clinic, or even a nurse practitioner. You can head to our website and find our referral form there. Referral coordinator um, will call you and book an appointment um, within two to four weeks to see us. Certainly, if it's related to cancer treatment, you're seen within a few days. Now, it can be very scary to think about your first appointment. It's exciting, and it can also feel daunting and challenging. So I wanted to break that down a little bit, what you might find. So... Um, Generally speaking, uh, you'll receive an email, a welcome email package. There'll be an online intake history. And then you'll either meet with a fertility specialist virtually or in person. Um, at that appointment, they're going to ask you questions. They'll review your history. Really, they just want to get to know you and, your, and where you've been and help you to figure out where you're going. So for the egg provider, they're going to ask things like your age, how long you've been struggling, if you're single or have a partner. If you've undergone fertility treatments in the past, they'll look at your gynecologic history. What are your cycles like? Talk about ovulation. Also interested in general health, like your pap smears. If you've been pregnant before, they may ask you questions around that. In terms of your past medical history, looking at systemic illnesses like diabetes, hypertension, thyroid disease, 
We're interested in surgical history, things that might affect the organs that are important in conceiving, abdominal surgery, pelvic surgery, surgery of the cervix, the uterus, the fallopian tubes. We're also interested in general surgeries that don't, like the appendix. Could you have had a ruptured appendix that might have affected things like the fallopian tubes or a bowel resection that might have created scar tissue? We review medications, making sure that you're on folic acid or a prenatal vitamin, checking the medications that you're on to see if they're safe to take in pregnancy, and then looking at allergies. We also ask family history, specifically focusing on systemic illnesses, but also pregnancy history, things that might be genetic and run in the family. In terms of lifestyle, we ask about smoking, alcohol, illicit drug use, and caffeine. We're interested in exercise, environmental and occupational hazards. The same questions in general we ask of the sperm provider, but we also ask a bit of a urologic history. Has there been trauma to the genital region? A torsion or twisting of the testicles, swelling around the testicles, as I mentioned. Undescended testicles, issues with sexual function, masses of the testicles or infections. All of these might lead us to particular investigations and diagnoses. I think there's a real misperception that you pay for everything, and that's not true. So all of the things that I've listed here, the intake, the history, the consultations, the follow-ups, the testing, all of this is covered by health insurance, your healthcare, Alberta healthcare insurance. When it comes to treatment and to medications, certainly these um, start to become to be paid privately. There can be third-party insurance benefits through providers like Alberta Blue Cross who support people going through infertility treatments for things like these medications. Now, where are some of the baseline testing that's important to us? In the egg provider, we look at things like baseline hormones, estrogen levels, FSH and LH. These are important reproductive hormones. We look at the thyroid. We also look at the ovarian reserve, the AMH and the FSH together, together give us a sense of where we sit in terms of number of eggs. Everybody's tested baseline for infection that's required in a fertility clinic in Canada. Generally, a pelvic ultrasound is performed to rule out things obvious like cysts in the ovaries, fibroids in the uterus, polyps in the lining. We typically ask for what's called a histosalpingogram or HSG. It's an assessment of the tubes and if the tubes are opened or closed. And then just good medicine, a pap smear, um, to make sure um, the cervix is healthy. In the sperm provider, we assess function with a semen analysis with anti-sperm antibodies. And those can either be done through Alberta Precision Labs or through our clinic. We may look at more advanced investigations, genetic testing, imaging like MRIs or saline infusion sonohistograms where water is placed inside the uterus. Surgery may be indicated, which we perform through ARC. Or consultations, our real belief is that the healthier the carrier, the healthier the baby. So we look at optimizing people for carrying the pregnancy before pregnancy. In terms of the sperm provider, we're very lucky in Edmonton to work with Dr. Phil Bach out of the K Clinic. He's a urologist who's done extra fellowship training in uh, reproductive health and infertility. And he's capable of doing more advanced types of investigations or surgery for the sperm provider. And we facilitate a consultation and then work very closely with him. Now, what types of diagnoses might we come up with? Well, in heterosexual couples trying for pregnancy, one of the two ovaries releases a mature egg. The egg is picked up by the fallopian tube. The serum swims up through the cervix into the uterus, into the fallopian tube and reaches the egg where fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube. The fertilized egg or embryo then travels down the fallopian tube and into the uterus and there it implants and grows. So you can imagine that anything that affects any of these different places, um, important for ovulation, fertilization, can impact and create a diagnosis. So eggs, tubes, ovaries, uterus. In terms of the sperm provider, we're looking at sperm. And for both partners, there are lots of factors that can impact these. Age, 
hormones, genetics, illness, lifestyle issues like smoking and drug use, medication, surgery, infections, and then anatomy, fibroids, polyps, as we mentioned, varicoceles or undescended testes. And this is what we're looking for when we do our investigations to help us to lead to a diagnosis. Certainly sometimes it's a egg provider issue alone. Sometimes it's a sperm provider issue alone. It can be mixed causes. And despite all of our testing, sometimes it's unexplained. Everything comes back as normal or within limits and we don't have a cause, which doesn't mean that we can't assist in terms of improving chances of pregnancy. In terms of treatments, um, I think again, there's a misperception that everybody needs IVF to get pregnant. As soon as you're seen by a fertility doctor, you're going to be pushed into doing in vitro fertilization. I wanted to break down that myth by showing you there's a number of different treatments that we use to um, work with patients who are struggling with fertility challenges. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of these six. I'm going to start talking um, about medication and intrauterine insemination, which we call IUI. Here we're looking to target um, two different factors, the egg provider and the sperm provider. So with medications like clomiphene citrate or seraphine, latrocell or femera, or injections of hormones, we use these to stimulate the development and release of a single egg or multiple eggs, depending on the diagnosis. In terms of the sperm provider, this can be the intended parent, a partner who can produce sperm to use for insemination, an anonymous donor where there's a single egg provider or a partner who doesn't have sperm and they're looking to buy sperm from a bank or a directed or known donor. That might be a friend or an acquaintance who wants to donate sperm for the use of an insemination. Here we take the sperm. It's prepared using a centrifuge or concentration gradient to kind of think of it like an obstacle course for sperm where we get the best swimmers at the end. We increase the rate of getting pregnant by increasing the chances that the maximum number of sperm reach that site. And that's done by placing a speculum inside the vagina, a very soft catheter uh, into the cervix and into the uterus and releasing the sperm. And the rationale of this is to make sure that there's an egg or eggs, and then to bypass cervical barriers, increase the density of normal moving sperm, and again, bring that sperm closer to the released egg where fertilization happens in the fallopian tube. Reproductive aging is real. And as we get older, we know that the quality and the quantity of eggs decreases. According to research, the optimal fertility for people with eggs occurs between the ages of 18 and 31 years. And as we mentioned, egg numbers begin to decrease in our late 20s and mid 30s. The number of eggs a person is born with and how quickly they use them is, lose them is very unique. Egg quality can be affected and egg quantity affected by things like genetics, environment, lifestyle, medication, surgeries. While we do have testing for quantity of eggs, we unfortunately have no test for the health of the egg or the quality of the egg. For people with sperm, the number and quality of sperm begins to decline, we believe, after the age of 40. This may mean that the time to pregnancy increases, as does the risk of miscarriage and perhaps even the risk of things like autism. If the plan or circumstances may mean that childbearing will be delayed, there's the option to freeze eggs or sperm for the future at Alberta Reproductive Center. And this option really empowers people to have children on their own timeline. So here the goal really is to preserve eggs where a decline in fertility is expected and that allows for the possibility of genetically related offspring in the future. Now we talked about this related to age and decrease in quality and quantity of eggs. That might be related to autoimmune diseases, cancer. That might be patients who are going through a transition where they're going to take uh, gender affirm affirming hormones or undergo surgery. This may be people who are genetically at risk for things like premature ovarian insufficiency, turners who carry a B or CA gene, um, or for those who socially are looking to delay childbearing. We know that the best results occur if eggs are frozen at less than 35 years of age. 
And really the main prognostic factor for success or getting pregnant in the future with them is the age up freezing and the number of eggs that we're capable of storing. Now, some people do need in vitro fertilization or IVF. This is an interesting timeline. Um, the first uh, children in Canada um, were born in 1982 from IVF. It was actually a set of twins up in the corner. You see Colin Rankin. Uh, he was born in Oakville, and that's him and his partner and their baby who was born through spontaneous conception. Now, the indications for IVF were long. Not everybody needs it, though. We use it for things like severe sperm factor, if people have tried other treatment, treatments and been unsuccessful, if there's been damage to the fallopian tubes or the fallopian tubes have been clipped, um, for endometriosis, uh, for people that have advanced age, reproductive age, unexplained infertility, there might be medical reasons that twins or multiples would not be indicated. In this situation, we can look at putting one embryo back and decreasing the chance of that happening. People who are undergoing surrogacy, using donor eggs, who want genetic testing or need genetic testing, and then those looking to preserve their fertility um, for cancer reasons or delaying childbearing. Now, what does IVF look like? So up at the top, number one, tests and ultrasound scans. So that's what we talked about, some of the baseline fertility testing. The ovaries are then stimulated using injections of medications. Ultrasounds are performed to watch the follicles or eggs growing. And then an egg retrieval is performed. Number three, where medications are given to the egg provider to make them comfortable. An ultrasound probe is placed into the vagina and a needle through the top of the vagina into the ovary where the eggs are extracted and handed to the lab. After that, the next step um, would be either to freeze those eggs, if that's a goal, or to go ahead and fertilize them, either with conventional IVF, or we place the eggs and sperm together in a dish and allow them to fertilize on their own, or with a procedure called ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where we inject one sperm into the egg. And that's very specific and individualized how the sperm fertilization strategy is selected for a particular person or couple. Once fertilization occurs, then the embryos are grown out to the blastocyst stage, which is day five or six of development. Genetic testing can be carried out at that point. And then an embryo transfer is performed. Support is given to um, that pregnancy. And if the pregnancy test is positive, then ultrasounds are performed. We have the capability to test embryos for their genetics, to detect, to see if they're chromosomally normal or abnormal before transferring them into the uterus. You might have heard terminology like PGTA. Those are embryos that are tested where we presume that the parents are genetically normal and we're simply looking for genetic abnormalities in the embryos themselves. PGTM, these are people that people that carry or have a particular genetic abnormality, um, like uh, cystic fibrosis or Huntington's or muscular dystrophy. And then PGTSR for structural rearrangements, where a person has the right complement of chromosomes, but they may be paired incorrectly. Now, some of our patients um, may require donor egg. And what are some of the indications for that? Low numbers of eggs. People have gone through menopause or premature ovarian insufficiency at less than age 40. Patients who are over the age of 45 or chances with IVF are extremely low. Those that have had struggles with IVF or poor quality of eggs and embryos. People who carry genetic disorders who are not interested in going through IVF with genetic testing or same-sex male couples or single men. There are no banks in Canada, so eggs are brought in from banks from the US and worldwide. They're brought into the clinic, frozen, they're then thawed and combined either with the sperm of a partner or a donor to create embryos. Some people will need to move to surrogacy, and surrogacy is where a person 
who with the intention of surrendering or giving to the child at birth to a donor or another person carries that embryo or fetus. And that embryo or fetus is conceived through an assisted reproductive procedure like IVF and um, derived from the genes of a donor or donors. So those might be the intended parents um, where they are the egg provider and the sperm provider. They may be using donor eggs or donor sperm or a combination of those. Surrogacy in Canada can only be performed if it's medically indicated. So that may be where the intended parents don't have a uterus to use to carry a child. The uterus has been determined to be not be able to sustain a pregnancy for perhaps anatomic reasons. Or they have a medical condition that would put their health or life at risk for carrying a pregnancy. So at Alberta Reproductive Center, we approach fertility care, I think, in a really different way. We really recognize that everyone is unique. So are two are their needs, their paths, their goals to realizing their fertility dreams. We know that fertility, the fertility journey can be intense and emotional and one where compassionate, supportive and personalized care is really fundamental, which is what we are offering. We've created a clinic where people are seen as a whole person and offer the opportunity to prioritize their mental health, nutrition, and physical well being. Many of our patients are already seeking out acupuncture, massage, natu naturopathic medicine, and counseling. And we support our patients in integrating wellness therapies into their treatments. We're the first clinic in Alberta to offer acupuncture on site on the day of embryo transfer, assisting those people who choose this service. We work with a beautiful registered psychologist who's going to speak in a moment. We have a registered dietitian. We offer education and support, and we have a genetic counselor available. Now, I wanted to offer just some uh, general advice about optimizing fertility, recognizing the importance of eating a healthy, balanced diet, prioritizing regular and restorative sleep, eliminating or limiting caffeinated beverages, uh, eliminating alcohol, nicotine, and drugs, taking a multivitamin with folic acid or a prenatal vitamin, participating in physical activity, avoiding exposures to environmental toxins, participating in activities or practices that decrease stress and increase joy, Optimizing other health conditions with your family doctor or obstetrician gynecologist. Avoiding lubricants that are toxic to sperm for those that are um, attempting to conceive spontaneously. Tracking the menstrual cycle and ovulation to narrow the fertile window. And then seeking support or mental health services. And we really understand that infertility can be frustrating and isolating and disappointing. And it can cause depression, anxiety, loneliness, sleep problems, grief, and marital stress. We see that people often delay major decisions. They put off advancing their careers, moving, going on vacation, socializing with family and friends. And we want to say that, or I want to say that there's no shame in addressing these feelings. Talking to your family doctor, your obstetrician, gynecologist, or your fertility specialist is really important or speaking to someone like Carolyn Anderson, who now is gonna talk a little bit more about the psychological impacts of infertility. And before I pass it off to Caroline, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Alberta Blue Cross and the Lois Hole Hospitals Women's Society um, for both highlighting this topic and really opening up this crucial conversation. Um, thank you so much for having me and uh, allowing me to speak today. And I'm, I'm just gonna take a minute now to um, just uh, change the presentation. So just give me a moment. Hello, I'm Caroline Anderson. I'm a registered psychologist in Edmonton, Alberta. And I just wanna thank you for inviting me here this evening. Um, I'm very honored to have, um, to speak this evening about a topic that I'm very passionate about. I just wanted to start by saying, uh, please note that the following is for informational purposes only and does not replace care by a trained mental health professional. So what is a reproductive psychologist? A reproductive psychologist is a specialized field in psychology, and we work with individuals ranging, ranging uh, from your first period, endometriosis, PCOS, pre-pregnancy, across pregnancy, 
childbirth, postpartum to peri to postmenopause. Um, in these different periods, there are a lot of significant events that can occur uh, during these critical periods. The main goal is to support the psychological health and the well being throughout all aspects of reproductive process, and this includes infertility. And in infertility, we are guiding individuals or couples through the many challenges. Uh, this evening, when I talk about the diagnosis of infertility, I want to include that it is primary, secondary, unexplained, and Agen sperm factor. Um, the diagnosis of infertility can be quite hard. Uh, research has shown that individuals dealing with infertility have the same anxiety and depressive symptoms similar to those diagnosed with cancer, heart disease, and AIDS. It is important to look at it not only from a medical diagnosis, but also from a psychological, emotional, and social perspective. It is a threat to a deeply held expectation of what one thought life would look like and what one's dream was. The psychological impact of infertility can vary for everyone. There are multiple um, things that I'm going to discuss over this, and everyone is going to vary throughout this. Things that are often seen are grief and loss, mourning the way you thought having children would look, sadness, fear, and anger. Uh, no one expects to be diagnosed with infertility, and there are a multitude of feelings that are going to emerge. And often it does look like grief and loss, and it is experienced like grief and loss. For many, the experience of the loss of control, being dependent on others for help, the timelines, lots of waiting. It's uncomfortable. It's a very vulnerable place to be. You feel exposed, out of control. You're easily hurt and triggered. And this is not only for a short period of time. These are very prolonged periods. One never knows when going into infertility what your road may look like and how long it may take. Um, often people will talk about body betrayal how my body is not doing what it should be doing. Or in secondary infertility, my body did it this before, why is it not doing it now? Worrying, worrying all the time about the tests, the results, the procedures, the cost, the future, a lot of bargaining and dreaming and wishing. The worry is a large part of this. Um, there's so many, as Dr. Daniel was showing, all these different components of cycles uh, and multiple tests that you're waiting for having done and wondering what it's going to show. Uh, a lot of individuals can experience depressive symptoms, mood issues. This can look as hopelessness, helplessness, a lack of motivation, sleep issues, appetite issues, decision fatigue, anger, sadness, fear. I think the decision fatigue is a large factor. There can be a lot of things um, that are brought to your attention and a lot of things that either individually or as a couple that you may need to make decisions about. Anxiety, a restlessness, irritability, tense, easily tired panic attacks. To continue, dreams, one's future feeling very threatened, threatened individually as a couple, a relationship, the strain, things are not going the way we planned, guilt, blame, shame, grief, sadness, questioning what did we do wrong, is it my fault? the feeling of not being enough. Often in a relationship, a multitude of feelings can come up around this and communication is what's key around this. There can be pressures from external. Our family really wants grandchildren and keep asking. It can be very isolating, sometimes because there's so many triggers, feeling very vulnerable. It can be said to be a silent struggle that in order not to be triggered, you start pulling back from things in your life can change the way you see yourself in the world, can become a part of who you are, become used to a constant state of fluctuating between despair and hope, and thus impacting the very quality of your life. I think it's important when we talk about infertility that we talk about the impact on relationships. And it has a large impact on a numerous relationships, on partners, family, and friends, and on your work. Partners, the communication issues that can arrive, how each per partner will grieve differently, how each partner will process what they're learning differently, intimacy issues, feeling pressure around conception that can impact uh, sexual intimacy, guilt, if it's one factor or the other, one partner feeling very guilty that they're the cause of this distress in this relationship, and this can lead to anger and sadness 
and blame and resentment and embarrassment for some. Family, there can be pressures around family wanting to support but not always knowing how or what to say. There can be pressure around feeling pressure to have grandchildren and maybe not an understanding around it, shame, embarrassment, not wanting to disclose what's happening. Friends can be very triggering, pregnancy announcements, not knowing where you belong, feeling like you're left out now of your friend circle, your friends that have moved on to having one or two children and you're not there yet. And thus you're isolating and you're feeling you're losing friendships. And communication, communication becomes a real struggle of what do you say to who, how do you say it? What do you say to work when you need time off? Do you disclose what's happening? What do you say to friends? How do you tell them? How do you talk to family about it? Some helpful tips. I think it's very important when you're going through infertility to always validate your feelings. It's very hard. This will not always be this way and it will not always feel this hard. Finding healthy ways to express your feelings. Self-compassion to remind yourself you are doing everything you can. Talk to someone a friend, a partner, a family, or professional. Journal to get the feelings out or read about others' experiences. Self-care can look different for everyone. Figure out what works for you. What may work for someone else may not work for you. Ask questions, advocate for yourself. Take control in areas you have control. Recognize some parts you do not have control and to really slow the process down and take one thing at a time. I always talk about one goal post at a time because if you look at the entire process, you can very much flood yourself and be overwhelmed. Support. If a loved one opens up about struggling with infertility, you may not know what to say. Try just listening, offering a safe place for your loved one to express their feelings. Ask them if it's okay to ask questions or what they may need from you. There are multiple support groups in Canada. Um, you can look them up. They're online. There's some in person. Look for friends, family, partner, a therapist. There can be blogs. Some people enjoy writing blogs. Some people um, like reading them. Find, from, find what works for you. It may vary. So we're coming into the holidays, and it can be a very stressful time. During the holidays, there can be numerous added stressors that one may encounter but we often use the holidays as markers of where we thought we would be in life. I find Christmas and New Year's can be when you were going through this last year of thinking, this was the year I was supposed to be pregnant. This was the year that was supposed to be different. And coming to the end of 2023, moving into 2024, there can be a lot of grief of this is not where I thought we would be. So once again, I talk about self-compassion. Be kind to yourself. If you're struggling with what to say to yourself, ask yourself, what would I say to someone I love struggling with infertility? Consider practicing mindfulness, being present in the moment. Create a mantra. Try positive self-talk. Sometimes a good thing is to limit social media. There can be a lot of triggers on social media or just pulling back and taking care of yourself. Take the time to journal. Write down your feelings. Discuss your fears, sadness, and anger. Spend some time validating your feelings and sitting with them. Be selective about accepting invites to events that you know may be challenging, where there may be children, pregnant women. It's okay to say no thank you. Plan some activities with your family, friends that you enjoy. Take control where you can. Start some of your own traditions. Ask for what you need from the people that care about you. Call a friend. Plan a trip. Take a quick getaway. Find some things that bring you joy. Continued, continued sharing with friends and family about how things are hard right now. It may be very vulnerable to do that, but sometimes sharing this opens this up and you never know once you start sharing who may be able to relate to what you're going through or what they've been through. Ensure you're getting enough sleep, physical exercise, massage, acupuncture. There are certain breathing practices that you can do. Make a plan of some things you can do if you're visiting family or kids. Spend some time doing things to distract yourself. Breathing. Combine deep breathing with visualization, a happy memory. Grounding. Get out into nature. Pay attention to your thoughts. They can influence how you feel. And lastly, set some boundaries. 
I want to thank Alberta Blue Cross and Lois Hole Women's Society for hosting and supporting these events. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline and Dr. Daniel. It was wonderful, so much to learn. Uh, did you have anything to add, Dr. Daniel, at the conclusion of Caroline's section there? Or are we get to dig into the Q&A portion? No, I just thought it was very insightful. I found myself just sort of agreeing and shaking my head as she was talking about just how powerful some of those suggestions were. Um, so thank you for sharing. Yes, absolutely. Thank you both for such being such a wealth of information and sharing your expertise with our community. Um, as we move into the question and answer portion of our event, please, uh, participants, please feel free to pop your questions into the chat. Um, you can also put them into the Q&A box. Um, and keeping in mind that if there are sensitive topics that do come up as things typically do when we're speaking about this uh, area of our health, um, if you need to step away from your computer, log out from Zoom if you feel triggered in any way, um, I think that's just honoring, you know, what Caroline just said about um, it's okay to say no it's okay to turn it off it's okay to back away from the screen and sometimes that's absolutely necessary so thank you for those suggestions and um, please participants feel free to use them okay so we do have a couple of questions um the first one i think speaks that i wanted to address i think speaks to the um redefinition read recent redefinition of infertility where um, we're now speaking to it as more of a disease or medical condition. Um, so the question is, do you think the government will realize that infertility is a medical condition and maybe cover some of the services beyond what's already covered? I know this is a little bit more of like a medical political question, but maybe you have some insight. Um, I mean, I certainly hope so. I think everything moves us forward um, to understand that um, infertility is a medical issue. Um, it's not something that people have control over. Um, and uh, if we believe it's a medical issue, then um, my hope is that like other uh, provinces in Canada, that um, the government will recognize it and provide some funding um, for fertility treatments, which certainly would make it more accessible um, for Albertans then to seek care and uh, to undergo the treatments that they need. Um, how we do that, um, looking for organizations that are advocating, talking to your MLA, um, and sort of finding out more information about where your voice can make a big difference, I think is important. Absolutely. And um, I think reaching out to your MLA is such a great idea. And also, I'm curious, do you, do you know of any of the organizations that are advocating for uh, fertility in Canada? Is there a specific group that people or resource that people could go to in that way? Um, so Fertility Canada, um, Fertility Friends Foundation, there's a number of national organizations that are really looking to push the needle forward um, and to bring awareness um, and to advocate for um, fertility funding. Um, there's some organizations that have private grants, um, so patients can, can talk to their fertility specialist about that as well. Wow, that's such important information. Thank you. Um, I guess the next piece is a little bit more about local uh, services. So um, if folks are in in Red Deer or, you know, because um, Edmonton typically does service a lot of uh, not just Northern Alberta, but Northern BC and, and other and territories um, where, you know, if, if there's not a, is the only support for people living outside of Edmonton and Calgary in Edmonton and Calgary at the moment? So I think um, that's a question um, about where sort of the resources are for people who are struggling with infertility. And mm -hmm. I think um, certainly a fertility specialist, like a reproductive endocrinologist and a fertility specialist is one, but 
family physicians um, are often the first line. Um, and if you ask your family physician, many of them are comfortable ordering some of the initial testing. Um, some family physicians who are interested um, in women's health will actually go ahead and initiate things like oral medications. Um, and sometimes that's all you need um, to conceive mm -hmm. um, or to support patients who are struggling with losses. Um, certainly obstetrician gynecologists also have the capacity to do some of those investigations and to initiate some of the initial therapies. Um, and then um, some don't, some don't feel like that's their area of expertise or within their scope and feel more comfortable referring on, or once they've reached the limitation of where they feel comfortable, they then refer on to a fertility clinic. Um, so I think for um, patients who are not in the Edmonton area, certainly that would be one option. Um, another option is that we offer virtual consultations for those that are not in close distance to Edmonton. Certainly that does mean a little bit of travel when it comes to treatments like intrauterine insemination um, or IVF, um, but there are lots of treatments that don't need that. For example, for someone with polycystic ovarian syndrome that isn't ovulating regularly, sometimes initiating an oral medication and getting the ovary to produce an egg every month um, is enough to assist with um, getting pregnant. And then there's nothing more that's needed or no further advanced therapies that are needed. Fantastic. So there are resources. It's just more a question of if locally they're available, like if the family doctor is comfortable, if there are OBGYNs and so on. And then if a patient wanted to come to your clinic, my understanding would be they would have their primary care physician or um, nurse practitioner, walk-in doctor, you suggested a few others, um, could fill in the referral document. And I, is that available on your website as well? Yeah, it is. The, re the referral okay. form is available there or um, simply to request. Um, it doesn't have to be our specific referral form. Your um, care provider, any physician can fit. Most people have their own generic referral forms that they use. We're super happy to receive any referral form and also happy at any point to see you. So it may be that you're just starting your journey and you're interested in being seen um, at ARC. We're happy to see you then. We're um, happy to see people who have really struggled and maybe have gone through treatments that haven't been successful, um, looking at um, are there other options, are there things that we think might, as, um, might assist them um, in getting pregnant that haven't been tried before. So it is an option to be referred to your clinic, whether you have had treatment before or if you've never um, encountered any uh, reproductive endocrinologist or specialist in that way. Absolutely. Yeah, at any point in the journey, we're happy to see people. Investigations aren't required before you come to see us. Uh, you might simply go to a walk-in clinic. You've never seen anybody or talked about it before. We're happy to see you for those initial investigations and discussions as well. Fantastic. It's great to to know that people can, re can reach you um, through those referrals. Um, Okay, a couple other questions that are a little bit more specific, um, speaking to autoimmune diseases. So there is a specific question here about, um, is there anything medically proven regarding killer T cells? T cells and infertility and and then trickling into that question of any particular strategies for autoimmune disease and infertility. Um, I think those are a little bit separate. Um, autoimmune disorders um, that are diagnosed by a physician, I think would be different than somebody who's struggling and wondering if there's an unexplained or undiagnosed autoimmune or immune immunocologic issue. Um, in terms of those that haven't been diagnosed, I think the struggle really is when you look at T cells and natural killer cells in the blood, those aren't necessarily the same as those in the uterus. There's a lot of research going on in terms of biopsying the uterus and looking at the biome and looking at different factors in the uterus. Um, but as far as I'm aware right now, there's nothing that has, um, what we call sort of RCTs or randomized control trials that have shown significant benefit. Um, so no, I, I don't think there's a specific immunologic treatment that we would recommend for people at this point that has strong scientific evidence behind it. 
In terms of those that ha truly have an autoimmune disorder, then we're looking at working with a rheumatologist or endocrinologist or family doctor or other healthcare provider um, to make sure that, um, that uh, they're stable, um, that they haven't had a recent flare, um, that they're on medication that is safe um, to conceive on um, and looking to see that some of those um, conditions are in remission or um, are as um, strongly optimized as they can be before pregnancy and making sure that it's safe then to get pregnant. And so there's the folks that have a diagnosed autoimmune disease, and that could be something like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, it could be something like um, ulcerative colitis, then there also could be, are there autoimmune diseases? I mean, do autoimmune diseases in general affect fertility? Um, so I think when we're looking at sort of general um, systemic illness, we know people, when people are unwell, um, when there's inflammation, um, that those types of things um, can decrease um, the, the chance to get pregnant. And more than that, as I mentioned, we're looking at a healthy carrier and a healthy baby. So in the middle of, say, a flare of your rheumatoid arthritis, that wouldn't be a time to go ahead and try and get pregnant. Um, we know that there can be autoimmune causes of things like premature ovarian insufficiency, so it must affect fertility. Um, I hope I hope that's sort of what you were getting at yeah, there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go into a couple of the more psychological questions. Um, the first one is about: uh, Is there a percentage of patients that have? experienced or would you say there's there are a significant amount of patients that have experienced trauma or PTSD type of responses during the process of working through infertility um, and then are there preferred or, or specific healthcare routes that address uh, fertility I guess we're asking about fertility trauma if that is something that is uh, considered to be um, a common experience or or not? Absolutely. There's recent research that is showing that the diagnosis of infertility and, and some of the events that can occur during a process of infertility can certainly expose one to trauma and thus potentially mm -hmm. impact everyone's, everyone's different to how trauma impacts them. But I'm mm -hmm. thinking around if you are traumatized, which can happen around it, um, they're trying to change kind of the definition that the actual threat of not having a child can be quite traumatic and that this could bring on very many symptoms that are similar to a traumatic episode and that you would want to seek trauma therapy around it. And that could be things from EMDR, uh, cognitive processing therapy, um, therapy in general, talking this out, grief support and such yeah yeah so a few key therapies that you uh mentioned for trauma specifically emdr cognitive behavioral therapy talk therapy i missed one of them in there sorry cognitive, cognitive processing um yeah of just kind of exposing yourself to what's happening and what the trauma is and and have um someone managing the trauma around it for you Absolutely. And I think when we think about trauma, sometimes we think about it as being like purely physical versus also that psychological trauma, even when you were speaking about like the holidays coming up and, and, and the like social exposures, mm -hmm. not just like a medical experience or, or anything like that. So absolutely, the threatened state that one sits in for a long period. Right. Yes, when you feel that threat is when when you experience trauma. Absolutely. And do you know if there are any financial supports available? Like, do those organizations that um, we were speaking about, Canada Infertility, did Canada Fertility rather, do they um, have any support for accessing mental health care services in someone's fertility experience? Do we do you know? Not to my understanding. No, and I apologize. It's Fertility Matters that I was thinking Yeah, Fertility about. Matters. And, uh, Sorry. I don't believe that they have a specific mental health component to it. 
Um, but certainly sometimes um, through people's insurance or um, employers, um, there is there are benefits to seek out um, uh, mental health therapy, acupuncture, massage, physiotherapy. So some of these supports, um, sometimes you can use either uh, your benefit plan or they might have a spending account and you might be able to put it towards that. I know Fertility Matters offers um, groups, peer-led groups mm -hmm. and such that are free to access. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as with trauma that you would want to probably have more of an individual, individual approach. Yeah. 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 So you could call your benefits provider and find out if they're, um, if you have an employee benefits package, if they're covering um, psychology services um, and, and that could be one way to get support, but then also some group therapy from fertility or peer facilitated um, uh, sessions through Fertility Matters Canada and, and those also Alberta of Health access, access 24 seven. Of course. Yes. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about Access 24-7? Um, Alberta Health Access 24-7 Mental Health and Addiction is covered by your Alberta health care plan. And it's a 24-hour, seven days a week line that you can call. And especially if trauma or, or struggling, that you can access mental health support that would be covered. And it's Fantastic. usually my understanding of what it, that it's usually designated within the postal code of where you are living and that they would assign you to an appropriate um, therapist. Fantastic, yes. And that's just a great 24 seven available resource yeah. to anybody that's in need. And that's not specific to fertility, of course, that's all psychological health and well-being. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay, let's do a very specific embryo question, Dr. Daniel. Um, we have uh, a question, uh, I'm just going to read it verbatim. It says, I understand that some recent papers have indicated that if a low level mosaic embryo can be carried to term, the mosaicism found on a PGTA largely resolves. Can you speak about low level mosaic embryos and your experience in transferring them Will ARC transfer mosaic embryos? So you've, you've struck on a really, I think, hot topic and maybe a bit of a contentious uh, area. Um, I think there are um, there's emerging evidence that mosaic embryos um, may result in healthy pregnancies. Um, I think that um, there's different levels of mosaicism um, and certainly depending on um, what the level is, um, certain clinics are more or less comfortable transferring those embryos. Um, the last time we spoke to iGenomics, there were only 1,500 reported live births that they were able to tell us about in terms of uh, mosaic embryos. Um, so I think you need to speak to your clinic and your healthcare provider about their comfort level, um, depending on whether or what type of mosaicism um, the embryo has, um, and whether or not your specific clinic is comfortable or not transferring those embryos. Um, there's lots of interesting areas, uh, mosaicism, chaotic embryos, I think with genetic testing, um, it just opens it up to so many more discussions um, in terms of what we're, what we're finding um, when we look at the genetics of a particular embryo. So it sounds like there's lots of work to still be done in determining um, how those embryos may or may not, what the risk factors might be and things like that. Like it's, it's an evolving field. It's an exciting field potentially, but we're just not a hundred percent there yet. All right. Um, okay. I think this is a really good clarification question about, um, the referral process. Um, do you, if I, um, I'm going to use your language cause I, I found that very, very helpful. If a egg provider is referred to your clinic, does the sperm provider also need to be referred? Or if they are a couple, um, if one is re referred is the other kind of automatically in, so to speak. 
Um, yes, we um, will accept a couple, whether it is two egg providers, two sperm providers, an egg provider and a sperm provider, um, a single um, person who's looking to parent by choice. So a single egg provider, a single sperm provider. Um, so yes, if you receive a referral from a physician, um, it includes you and um, your partner. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then this question, it, it says, are costs associated with seeing the reproductive psychologist or dietitian? So I think that's clarifying if they're, um, if the reproductive psychology services or dietitian services provided at ARC are uh, a private service out of pocket or if they are covered under the Alberta Health Services as well. Yeah, unfortunately, they're not at this, at this time. Um, certainly, um, your um, primary care uh, network, your your PCN, um, uh, you do have access to dietitians that are covered there. Um, however, um, if you're accessing a, a dietitian or dietitian at ARC who is specifically fertility um, trained or has fertility awareness. Um, unfortunately, it's not covered specifically, but if you did, again, have benefits, um, then you could, because she's registered, you could apply them to your benefits potentially. Um, there are also lots of providers in the community, so we're not looking to break relationships. If you have a registered psychologist or a registered dietitian or an acupuncturist you work with, we fully support you in continuing to work with um, your provider. Um, we will be introducing some support groups through ARC um, that are going to be free. Those are going to happen very shortly um, in December and in the new year. So um, look for them if you're interested in something that is covered. Um, and uh, Caroline will be part of um, initiating and driving that forward. So that's really exciting for us and, and for people um, who are seeking fertility services. And you won't necessarily need to be a patient at ARC. Um, you could be anybody struggling with infertility. Wow, that's such an incredible resource for the community. Thank, thank you for coordinating that. Like that's just so valuable. I know people are struggling um, in all areas of their reproductive health and having a resource that's specific to fertility is, is for their psychology and everything else is just so fantastic. So thank you for coming coming up with that. Uh, very exciting news. Um, it doesn't look like there are any more questions. I will kind of babble on for a moment to see if any more come in. Um, but thank you both so, so much for your time this evening and for sharing your expertise. Um, both presentations were so insightful and I know our community is going to benefit from this information. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, to the participants that are still on the call, um, if you uh, get an email, you will get an email later from us uh, with a survey. We actually uh, had many people request in our surveys that we host a discussion about fertility. So we do take that feedback and we, we put it into action. So please fill out those feedback surveys. And if you do fill out the feedback survey, you will be entered to win a $25 gift card courtesy of Alberta Blue Cross. Um, so if you get an email from Alberta Blue Cross, it's not fake, it's real. You actually won something, it's not just a scam. And that leads me to, of course, thank our sponsor, Alberta Blue Cross. Thank you so, so much for making these events possible for the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society. Society. We could not do it without their support. Um, they sponsor this lecture series. They help us coordinate. They are just invaluable partners. So thank you. Thank you, Alberta Blue Cross. Um, our next discussion uh, between us will be held in January. Um, so we, we take a pause in December as we know it's a very busy uh, time of year for folks. And so stay tuned and look forward to hearing about what our next Between Us discussion will be about in January. And 
Yes. Last question. Will this recording be available later? It does go up on our YouTube channel. So if you search for uh, the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society YouTube channel, you can find actually all of our previous recordings, um, including last season episodes, if you will. Um, and uh, our last month's discussion on urinary tract infections with uh, Dr. Shazma Mithani from emerge. So um, you can find us online. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Daniel. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Alberta Blue Cross. Thank you, participants. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.